Hey all, Scott here again, and uh, today I'm going to go over uh, one of my absolute favorite modules of all time. Uh, and I'm going to break this into a couple parts. I'm only going to go through the first nine pages, really, of this module. Um, but it's part of the B-series, um, which were the basic um, uh, outlier for the uh, Dungeons & Dragons uh, line way back uh, in the 80s. I think this was done in 1983. Uh, it's B5. It's written by Douglas Niles and it's Horror on the Hill. Uh, I have my copy of Horror on the Hill here. I have two copies of this because it's my favorite one and because this one fell to pieces because I've used it so many times. Uh, I'm going to read to you a little bit, uh, just one paragraph. This is the beginning of this again. This is by Douglas Niles. Uh, Guido Sport. The end of the Trader's Road. Perched along the banks of the mighty river Shrill, this isolated frontier settlement is the last stop on the caravan routes. The mile-wide river is all that separates the fort from the shadowy bulk known only as the Hill, a land of nameless terrors and ancient legend. It continues on from there. It's a nice little write-up uh, by Douglas, and it's funny because I, I talked to him uh, once I was doing an interview with him and uh, I had to bring this up because it's my favorite module he ever wrote and he had no memory of it. Didn't even know he wrote it. It was pretty, fun <laughs> pretty funny <laughs> actually. But uh, as the years go by and I've written so much, I can absolutely see uh, how you don't remember things uh, that you've written. But anyway, um, this is, uh, has a great cover um, by uh, Jim Rosloff. And that cover is one of my all-time favorites. I actually uh, did it myself. I redrew it uh, for a module I made when I was probably 15 or 16 years old called Ice on the Water. And I also uh, did a, uh, an homage to it. I had um, Michael Wilson do an homage uh, for in one of the backs of uh, one of my early folios, which you can see here. And anyway, uh, so obviously I, I love the Jim Rosloff cover. I love the fact that, uh, that you know, you see the hill, you see the vents, uh, which play a big role in this uh, module as well that are smoking out of it. Um, and also the interior artwork is done uh, by uh, Jim Holloway. And Jim just absolutely slew the interior of this module. It's got some absolutely great art. Uh, I might put it at a couple pieces at the end of each one of these. But again, this is gonna be the first nine pages uh, I'm going to grab my notes here and just go over it. Uh, when I typically um, put together uh, an adventure, I don't do anything um, on what I would consider um, board gaming. Uh, a lot of people, you can play D&D &D, uh, a lot of different ways or any games a lot of different ways. One of them is just do a single session, um, something that you might find at a con, uh, where you sit down just like a board game and you just go through it, basically uh, a dungeon crawl. Uh, point system it out, do whatever you want to, and it's done. I don't do anything like that when I when I when I'm a DM. Uh, if it doesn't have a point, if it's not going somewhere and going to add on to something else and a tapestry of my crazy imagination, uh, I just won't do it. Um, everything that I do has to have a point, a purpose, and it has to link back to something else. Uh, I started this uh, when, when I was very young, uh, probably in seventh grade, uh, with my first character, and uh, now that character is had children and their children and children and children and children and children until I think I'm, I don't know, eight or nine generations deep in the nameless realms. Um, but anyway, I'll get into that uh, on a different video just a bit about my storytelling. But anyway, I just wanted to tell you when, when I set up this module, I always look at something uh, not as a one shot, not as a sit down, play it, be done. Um, so B5, Horn on the Hill, Douglas Niles. Um, this one, uh, starts out, I think it's got the first three or four pages are just boilerplate. Uh, they're gonna go through uh, how to build a party, uh, stuff like that, because it is a basic uh, module. Um, and then there's a, uh, a table um, that you're gonna have that allows you to uh, establish some rumors that the, the players or the characters might be able to hear upon coming to Guido's Fort. And I think Guido's Fort is the most important thing. Anytime that I'm going to set up a, a fort on the frontier, be it Keep on the Borderlands or Rosloff Keep or anything like that, I always have to go through and try to set up uh, something to make the fort cool. This is, a, this is at the end of the Caravan Road, Douglas says it. Um, so anybody that gets out here is going to be stragglers because you're not going to make a lot of money in that caravan because it's not going any further. So anything that just gets left out here, uh, it's going to be few and far between. This is out in the 
um, uh, the, the forests, as you can see the hill, um, you can, there are pine trees and regular trees there. Uh, vents is kind of a, um, a cold mountainous setting, uh, but obviously it's the summertime when this is set. But again, you could set this at any time, uh, and it might be a really cool way to to bring in a different flair to it if you wanted to add uh, some new wrinkles. Uh, that's one thing I've thought about. I've run it, I don't know, eight or nine times. I don't think I've ever run it in the winter, um, but it is an option to even set it in the fall or late summer and have it uh, kind of meander through into an early onset winter because you have the ability um, with it to use um, Guido Sport as a base of operations and the characters can go out, uh, come back and forth over the River Shrill. And it, it details some of that as well. If you want to buy your own boat or you're going to get a ferryman and how much that's going to cost you. All that's taken care of in the beginning of it as well. But I wanted to just talk a bit about Guido Sport. It tells you nothing about it other than it's just a Ford out there somewhere at the end of Traders Road. So anytime I'm going to set up a town like this, I usually go for something like two guilds. Uh, because I like to have the characters have the ability to come back and learn something, especially in a low-level campaign like this. Uh, I usually do like a Rangers Guild, especially if it's the Frontier, and then maybe a Merc or Fighter Guild that you can learn uh, different skills as well. Uh, skills aren't too important when you're talking about AD&D, unless you're talking about specialization or double specialization or just learning new uh, weapon proficiencies. It's much more important when you're talking about 5th edition because you're going to learn a lot of different skills as you go up in level. And those things could be learned at the guild. So like I said, ranger, merc. I do one standard religion typically in the town that's going to have a cleric there for base healings. But probably not anything in this level that's going to be raised dead. Unless you wanted something specifically. That's going to be a more uh, base religion with gods. Then I have a, uh, a heathen religion that's going to be druidic. Uh, maybe some stones uh, placed around and a wandering druid uh, that has contact with the rangers this also allows you to use a, a druid character and have some contact as well um, I, I typically have a retired rogue in the town probably met a tavern and then uh, you could have an astrologer or something like that that's going to be your magic user who could teach spells or give you uh, upper spell level options uh, and that way you can get everybody in the town kind of uh, or everybody in the party kind of coming back to the town for a particular reason and making connections here again, this is something I always do. I have to have connections, or for me, it's not worth playing. I have to have something back to the town that means something to people and a reason that they would want to go back to the town. And I also like to put in something to the town I call threats. That's typically going to be something that um, gives the party problems, but isn't necessarily something that they can just pull out their sword and attack. This would be uh, a constable that doesn't like them or has a problem with them for a particular reason. Maybe a bad cleric uh, who's overly zealous in their religion, pushing it on them. You can do a lesser noble that, that maybe controls this area. Uh, and then one of my favorites that I've used uh, within this module is a poacher who's also an agent for the Goblin King who lies across the River Shrill. Um, so that'll take you through the base setup for Guido Sport. The River Shrill obviously um, disconnects the town from the hill. The hill is where the adventuring takes place. There's a nice uh, interior map, uh, topographical, that you can take you through on a lot of trails. Um, and... Uh, through the setting. If you're going to start this as a first level campaign, that is where you're going to lose use the town coming back and forth, I think, more often uh, because the characters can build strength. If, if you're going to come in, uh, what they're talking about at the top end, third or fourth level when you come into this, they're probably just going to go out, go right to the main meat of it, down into the dungeons, through the monastery, um, and you know, take things on then. But like I said, if you started at first, great way to start things out is go to Guido Sport, establish those characters, establish context, and then come back and forth, ferrying their way on their boat or another boat uh, between um, the what they're fighting on the hill outside, or even in the first level of the dungeon, and uh, then before the end game. Um, the setting itself uh, takes place, like I said, in a northern kind of mountainous setting. Um, when I typically envision it, I'm probably looking at more like the Smoky Mountains and not the Rockies. Um, if you're taking something like that, a lower hill, but vents are very important here. Um, they're venting volcanic um, activity and uh, steam up through the area, which you can fill uh, the forest floor with. 
and also uh, stream down into the night or make kind of light flares, which is always nice. Something to give the uh, the characters a little vision. If, you, if you're printing out pictures, you could go for some, some great parks on the east coast of the United States. You can do, uh, if you're doing the fall, you can make sure you talk about the leaves and uh, and whatever time of year and the changing of the seasons. Uh, there's something that I, I have that all my players know throughout the years, something I call flavor. Um, this is something that I always have to put in to make sure that um, you give the characters more of a base on the setting uh, and um, just give them a connection to, to what they're seeing. I always like to describe something, maybe a griffin flyover. It might panic the players, but it can be a beautiful sight. Just just say that it's it's something neat to see. It's something that they don't often get to see, um, or any kind of things. A unicorn in a glade. Uh, one of the things you can have um, as well that could be threats or just things that you could put in for flavor. Um, some kind of insect shaman I put in a couple times um, because there are a lot of uh, like weevils and, and bugs and stuff that that Douglas has put into the adventure on the surface. And that could be uh, kind of a person that's in, par uh, in charge of those threats. Uh, the fae or the fairies are always something neat. Toadstool rings, anything like that that they could run into on the surface. You can always throw in throw that in as well. And then my absolute favorite creature, uh, the displacer beast. A lot of times I'll have that uh, be hunting in the forest as well. And it can be very dangerous and grab people up from uh, kind of like predator uh, uh, and just grab people off the forest floor. It's a tough creature too. Uh, and it's probably going to be hit and run, so it's not something I would use uh, because it's just going to rip a first level party up, uh, but it's something to keep a threat going on them. Uh, obvious threats that are going to be in random encounters that Douglas has put into the module as well, hobgoblins uh, and goblins. Both of these should be sub-banded, um, which is to say they're going to have some kind of... Um, uh, signet or logo on them. You need to make those up. It makes it more fun if you know that they're from the yellow fangs or the red feet or something like that. But all of them will have something that will denote that they are under the overall purveyance of the Goblin King. Uh, the Goblin King would be the first level of the dungeon once you go down into it, which is after page nine. Um, there also, uh, there's a, a monastery uh, on the surface which has undead in it as well, which you can use the undead to have them creeping around if you want to give them a little creepier vibe, um, especially if you have uh, the mists and stuff coming in from the vent. And then, of course, uh, the Goblin King could have his bands up, and you need to make a logo for that as well. Um, always come up with something cool for the Goblin King, and they can have that kind of incorporated into whatever else that they've got going on with their smaller band logos. Um, uh, Niles also put in two witches. Uh, it's kind of funny because uh, Jim Holloway, who did such great art in this one, does kind of these um, homely baking uh, witches who have like aprons and uh, they want you to come into their little uh, uh, hut. And uh, that's fine and dandy uh, if you want to run it like that. Uh, but what I've always enjoyed, if I'm going to use a witch, I'm going to use something uh, straight up anime or something straight out of Conan uh, the Barbarian, where uh, it's, she's gonna be a rough witch. Uh, probably, you know, beautiful and, and uh, you know, deadly. And, and there are two of them here, so they can play off of each other. Uh, you can do you know, nice witch, bad witch. You can do anything like that. Uh, but anyway, the witches are a cool um, threat on top of the surface. I say you put some time in on them um, because they could also be uh, something that could be used uh, later or have good contacts with, especially if they have other uh, modus operandi, if they're not looking to just kill characters. Maybe they're sick of the orcs uh, or the goblins or the hobgoblins and they want them uh, brought to them or anything like that. The last thing I'm going to touch on here in the first nine pages um, is on the hill, and this is on the cover as well, uh, that you see uh, what Douglas refers to both as Neanderthals and caveman. Now there's a big difference, obviously, we know between a Neanderthal and a caveman, um, but I tend to like using the, the them as Neanderthal. If you're using them as Neanderthal, I typically say that they're strong, so uh, I usually give them just off the top a plus one uh, bonus to hit or damage. Uh, if you're using fifth edition, you can give them brute, which gives them an extra die. Uh, they are listed in the module as not being able to speak, but they do speak um, with sign. So that is something you can go through. They could have shamans. Uh, they can be very helpful to the party, especially if they're out on the hill. You can use their caves as a fallback point. 
Um, or you could incorporate a couple of them as followers or henchmen that will go into the dungeon with you and smash things up and take damage for you, um, especially if you want to use uh, the signs or develop that even further. One of the things I do, um, if you have a druid uh, or you have a ranger, both of them are probably known to have signs, um, especially the ranger, and those signs might be able to easily be able to be used to uh, communicate with the Neanderthals. Like, let's say their sign language is very similar to what the, the rangers in the area use or at the guild. Um, any of these things uh, are, are something that could be used. Again, this is just the first nine pages of this module, uh, but there are a lot of different options here. There's a lot of opportunity for gaming. Uh, I highly suggest you go out and get this module. It's not expensive, uh, unless prices have just gone crazy and for old modules, but I don't think they have. It's a great introductory module, not only for D&D, but for fifth edition. And it's so easy to convert because all you're basically talking about are hobgoblins and goblins and uh, skeletons or ghouls, all of those found in, uh, in your, uh, you know, your monster manual. Um, and then you could just, you know, put together anything you wanted to for the witches. Uh, very, very easy. Um, it's a great learning experience and a great way to start a, a, a much larger campaign. Um, so I highly suggest it. Again, this is the first nine pages of this module. We're going to go into the Goblin King and the next one, and then further down on the, uh, as the dungeon goes lower. It's three levels, and it has, of course, a dragon at the end of it. Uh, great, great basic adventure. So I hope you enjoyed this, and uh, give me any comments if you have. If you ever played uh, Horror on the Hill or you have any other ideas for it, love to hear them in the comments. And please subscribe. Uh, that would always help me out to get more subscribers. And uh, thanks again for listening.